Oh, yeah. It was another busy and crazy day in the NBA. There were 13 games on for us to recap. Michael Bolton, are you there? I hope you are. Yeah, you are. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and who the hell else did you think it would be? Get in here, you pair of flame and glass. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. Go ahead and hit the old thumbs up, hit the subscribe, ring the notification bell and leave your comments down below. We have a lot to talk about. As I said, 13 games on. So we're going to dig into that stuff because otherwise the show is going to go on forever. Um, let's just have a look at some quick news updates. Of course, we had the... Just like, what the hell is going on? The story of Isaiah Stewart punching Drew Eubanks in the face prior to the game. Stewart wasn't playing. Just some sort of confrontation in the, t- the hallway an hour or so before the game. Punches him in the head and that was it. Eubanks ended up being available to play the game, but there's going to be an investigation. Police were involved. What's wrong with this guy? Apart from being not a starting power forward that the Pistons have devoted their entire energy to turning into a power forward while ruining the hopes and dreams of many fans and other players on their team, um, all catering to Isaiah Stewart. And now he chucks a punch at a player off court after he went crazy like an idiot against LeBron James. Like, my guy, what are you doing? Absolutely insane stuff once again. Now, if it turns out that uh, he was completely in the right and he was defending himself against Drew Eubanks, then sure, doesn't seem that way. The Suns have come out and said completely unprovoked, so we'll see what ends up happening, but clown. Will he be suspended? The NBA is usually pretty soft on this stuff, like generally very, very soft on this stuff. Uh, Look, it'll be, what, two games? He's already injured anyway. Uh, We're not rostering Isaiah Stewart anyway, and if you're asking me the question, who's the big beneficiary here? We've seen what the rotation looks like anyway. What it does is it raises the floor of Fontecchio. It raises the floor of Asar. But well, I'm not, I don't think we're sitting here going, well, that's going to be 20 games for Isaiah Stewart. The NBA doesn't dish those out. You don't, you don't, they don't give those sort of suspensions. Draymond Green's at his millionth incident. And what did he have? What, 12 games or whatever it was? So yeah, it's not going to be something impactful. He's just an idiot. We've got an update on Chris Paul. He's going to be reevaluated again in 10 more days, which rules him out for about three games at least post All-Star break. I don't know that you need to be 100% on top of just, I've got to grab Chris Paul. I don't know what he's going to do or his minutes going to be like on that team now that Pajemski stepped up and Clay and Wiggins are playing a little bit better on and off, I guess, and Draymond's back. I'm not sure that I'd be rushing to grab Paul under every circumstance. The other update we got was Kawhi. Obviously, he's out today with that groin issue. Um, and as we expected, it seems like it's nothing. Monty Williams said, yeah, it's nothing serious. We'll just see what happens. I'm not sure if he's going to play in the All-Star game. Yeah, he's not. Um, So it's, I believe, just something small that was slightly irritating him, and they're just going to use this extended time off uh, to get him out of the All-Star break, to have a rest, to heal up for the stretch run heading into the playoffs. That's, That's how I see that happening. That's what I think is going to happen, and I think that is where we're at with that. Let's go into the games because uh, we've got a lot of them to talk about. We did the waiver wire trends earlier in the day on the waiver wire show. The first game was the Atlanta Hawks and the Charlotte Hornets. Nyekara Kongwu's out with that toe injury. Should be back after the break. And that meant that the big fella, Bruno Fernando, was able to step into that starting lineup, which, of course, he was because they didn't have any other centers. The Hornets get their first big win of the season. This is the first win of over nine points for the year, 122-99. On the Atlanta side... I don't know what's going on with DeAndre Hunter because he's never been this player before, but he is at the moment. 28 minutes, 21 points, two threes. Now, I will urge caution. Part of the issue with Hunter has been he's never been this efficiency player and he's always lacked peripheral stats. So again, we can look at 21 points and go, that's great because it is. But three rebounds, one assist, one steal, zero blocks. And part of the reason his last couple of games have been really good is seven of seven from the line and eight of eight from the line. He was seven of seven from the line here and shot 50% to get his 21 points. Yes, he's been a top 120 player over the last two weeks in only 23 minutes. If you wanted to take a crack at that, do it. 
I don't really think that this is going to be a long-term sustainable thing. But predictably, we saw Sadiq Bey fall away, 14-4 and on 39%. Uh, he'd been on that ridiculous hot streak. It's almost turning into a herd of monk type scenario where one guy's up, one guy's down, leaving them both, I think, to be like streamable 12-team league players. As for Bruno, he had 6-12 and with a steal and a block in 26 minutes. That is streamable if he becomes a starter. He also had foul trouble that limited him. Not if he becomes a starter, if Capella and Okongwu remain out. Jalen Johnson played a lot of center. He had 19 and 12. And Trey and DeJounte just were really bad, I thought. Trey Young, 12, 2 and 12 on 33%, 12 attempts. And DeJounte had 13, 7 and 4 with two blocks on 33% as well. Just bad games from both of those guys. And I already mentioned Sadiq was pretty disappointing as well. And I do think if you are looking to clear roster space, Sadiq is fine to cut. For the Hornets, um, yeah, Trey Mann, 30 minutes, 21, 8 and 6, 4 threes, 2 steals. Interestingly, he wasn't in at the end for the closing group, and then they put him in with about a minute left or whatever. It was a little weird. Anyway, they're up big, but that's still great, and he just needs to be added everywhere. I think we're adding Grant Williams as well. Talked about that earlier on the Waiver Wire show earlier this morning. He had 15 and 10 with two steals. Yeah, look, just looks like a completely different player. And Vasily Micic had 13, 2 and 5. He was grabbed in a lot of 12s, Micic. I think you can drop him there and leave him for the deeper formats. What we wanted to see was what was going on with Brandon Miller's usage. Well, it was fine here. That was great. Good to see. 26, 6, and 4. One steal, three blocks. Efficiency a little bit down, but at least we got the attempts back up. And Miles Bridges had 17, 5, and 4. So a little bit of a dip from him um, after those couple of hot games. I think Cody Martin's more of a 14 teamer. He had 6 and 7 with four assists. And Big Dick Nick, disappointing. 12 and 7 on 100% shooting with no other peripheral stats. I, I do still think Nick is a 12-team league guy, but it's not going to work for everybody. He doesn't have gigantically high upside. He is in a little bit of a down patch as well, but I do think we still want him to be uh, on a roster in a, as I just adjust my microphone, in a 12-team league. Today's episode is brought to you by Robin Hood. Robin Hood, did you know that even if you have a 400, 400, 401, no, a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar that you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April the 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar that you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info claim as of quarter one, 2024 validated by Radio global market research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first. 3% match must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to US customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. That's great to, great to hear, Robinhood. Um, all right, let's go into the next game. We've, we're one down. We've got 12 more to go because, you know, the NBA loves a nonsensical schedule, but that's okay. Um, the second game was the Knicks traveling to take on our Orlando Magic, and we had the lineup change there. A couple of them, actually. We had Mr. Black starting for Marco Fultz for Orlando. We had Caleb Houston starting in place of Jalen Suggs for the Magic, so both of their backcourt guys were out. And, of course, in New York, we also had Alec Burks starting because Dante DiVincenzo, despite them listing him as questionable with a hamstring strain, he didn't play. What a shock. Actually, it's a little bit of a shock the NBA didn't push that. But why they these idiots would list him as questionable and list Contavious Caldwell Pope as questionable when it was as clear as anything that they weren't going to play is just absolutely infuriating. Like, we knew this was going to be the case. Why do you have to lie about it? Anyway, the Knicks got pumped 118 to 100. The final score here in this one. It's hard to talk a lot about this Knicks team because of just who is out. No Randall, no Ananobi, no DiVincenzo, no Hartenstein, no Boyan Bogdanovich, no Mitchell Robinson in this one. Um, just really tough. So look, Brunson did what he could. 33, 1 and 6 with two steals. Cool. The big sell high on Preston Chua is so massively open. Like 23, 14 and 5 is a great game. That is a really good game for Mature and he should be rostered. That is 43 minutes. He won't probably play 43 minutes in three consecutive games combined when players return. For now, it's awesome. Love it. But it's not going to hold. Jericho Sims played 39 minutes to get to 8-8. Eight and eight. We're not even rostering him with these guys out. Josh Hart didn't just didn't play well. 
Four, three, and two with two steals on 25%. Again, we hold him. He will not be a 12-team league guy when players return. And Alec Burks had 13 and three on 31%, which is bad. Um, while guys are out, we hold him. But I think I think we'll get DiVincenzo back straight after the break. I think we'll get Hartenstein back and Bogdanovich back. So if you did want to make a move and drop Burks, like go for it. That is totally okay. We got 32 minutes out of Juice McBride. He had eight points with two threes and two steals but shot only 18%. It's hard to take much away from this. My big thing is, though, that Achua is just a huge sell high and that guys like Hart, Burks, are just going to be droppable really soon. For the Magic, that's a huge win with both their backcourt guys out as well. They also lost Wendell Carter Jr. late in the game. He didn't go to the locker room, but he had a knee problem and never returned. Nine and six in 24 minutes. Really hard to consider him a must roster player. Get that garbage out of here! Mr. Black played 23 minutes. He had four points on 29%. He has been really quite poor from a fantasy perspective, despite the amount of starts that he's gotten. That's why he's out of the rotation when they're healthy. And Polo was excellent. 36, 7, and 5. Six triples, 75%. We love to see that from Bunkero. And Wagner bounced back from a poorer game yesterday. 21, 3, and 6. Three steals and a block. Only 15 minutes for Isaac on the back-to-back, but he did play. We're not rostering him in 12-team leagues. Cole Anthony got 25 minutes with both starting backcourt guys out. Okay, don't care. Back to the Wendell Carter one, I should have mentioned. Now, I don't know what this injury is. Hope Maybe we get an update. And the problem here is that the All-Star break's in the middle. Otherwise, we would consider grabbing Goga Badadze. Goga only played five minutes, but if Wendell is out, then Goga will be a 12-team league player. But the thing is, Wendell might be fine. He might sit out, rest through the All-Star break, and be ready to play the first game back. So I don't think that I would make a preemptive ad on Goga or on Mo Wagner, who had 10 points. But it is something just for us to keep in mind in case something more serious comes out of the Wendell Carter Jr. injury. The next game is the Miami Heat and the Philadelphia 76ers. The Heat do it again. Undermanned against, obviously, another undermanned team. The Sixers, 109-104, they win. Duncan Robinson, 20 points, 5 threes, 4 assists, 64%. Now, they only play one more game in Week 17, and that is next Friday. I think Duncan is still worth having. So I think you'll start him on that day, and I think the Rogier absence probably lasts another week or two after the break would be my guess, and Robinson will be good through that time. Yeah, it does make it harder, but I think I would still hold him. Bam had 23 and 14. Hero had 23, 7 and 7. And the other replacements, yeah, not so good. It was a much better game from Jaime Huckers, who had 12 and 9 with two steals in 32 minutes. Is that good enough to hold through this time? No. Caleb Barton had 8 and 1 with three assists and two steals. That is absolutely not worth holding. And Nikola Jovic, little Chungus, who went off yesterday, went back to being Nikola Jovic. He had three points in 14 minutes and had four fouls, which limited his playing time. But again, I thought maybe there might be something a little bit different. He looked good. No, it's still the same inconsistency and poor production and then foul trouble there. So we're not holding through these gaps in the schedule that currently exist. In this one, it was the big fella, Haywood Highsmith, that stepped up. 16 points, four threes, two steals, and a block in 36 minutes off the bench with uh, Jovic in foul trouble. And that Jovic, Martin, Highsmith, the Love, Kane, those guys, they all rotate through. It's hard to get a consistent level there. For the Sixers, they were without Harris and Melton and Lowry and Batum and Covington and, of course, Joel Embiid. So we got huge minutes again from Buddy Heald. 22 points, five threes, 10 assists, and two steals. Now, pregame, uh, self-branded hat legend Nick Nurse said that he was going to be starting Buddy Heald moving forward next to Nick Batum with Ubre and Melton coming off the bench. He didn't say Ubre and Melton coming off the bench, but he just mentioned those other guys as part of the starting group. Now, that's great for Heald, but I'll tell you what, he's not happening. He's not playing 44 minutes a night. He's not averaging 10 assists per night. This is a huge sell-high chance for Buddy Heald. If I could get top 50 back, I would do it. If I could get top 65 back, I would do it. I'm a little worried. As for Melton, I'm not certain we need to hold him. Yeah, he's been great, but he's not going to play 30 minutes. I don't know when the back injury is going to heal. And there's other players in the mix here. There's just not enough there for me to be holding through all of this nonsense with Melton. But the fact that he's there and Lowry's there off the bench means that he won't play 44 minutes. He won't get these assists. It just won't happen. So be happy to sell on that. Torres Maxey had an ankle sprain. He went to the locker room. He got it taped up. He returned. Still played 39 minutes. He had 30 and 6 with 7 assists on really good shooting, while uh, Paul Reed played 39 minutes. 18 and 12 with 2 assists and a block on 58% shooting, 100% from the line. He needs to be rostered. Needs to be rostered. And Ubre does not. 9 points in 33 minutes, 36%. He is just not very good, and he's also not a good fantasy player. And if you can't do things consistently good with all these players out, what are you doing? 148th over the last two weeks, 34 minutes a night. I'll tell you now, it's not about to get better. So when you want to move on from someone, he's the guy that you can jack off. Get that garbage out of here! 
Um, Ricky Council was pretty energetic, I thought, here. He's a good dunker. He's a 23-minute player in this game, 13, 4, and 2. He does lack some issues or, or lack some skill with his shooting. And again, there's just a million players out. He's a two-way guy. I'm not going to read a huge amount into this for the mayor, but it was a good uh, performance from Council. He's had a couple of other pretty good performances. But I think it's also one of those ones where it's like, yeah, look, everyone's out, and he stepped up and played well, and maybe he does belong on a full-time contract in the NBA. I'm just not like 100% certain that he's going to turn into this strong, you know, really awesome rotation-level play. I'm not, I'm not fully there. Uh, with that at that uh, at this stage. That'll bring us on to the next game, which was the um, Chicago Bulls and the Cleveland Cavaliers. We did have a change, and we thought this might happen. Up against the big boy Cavs, the Bulls did go back to Drummond starting. They pushed Torrey Craig to the bench. They kept Ayo Desumu in the starting lineup, though, leaving the returning Alex Caruso on the bench, which was very interesting. The Cavs win it 108-104, the final. Well, so 108-105, the final score here for Chicago. Drummond played 28 minutes, had 10 and 15 with a steal on block. That is totally good. That is a totally good 12-team league line. My problem with that is that if you only get that once every six games or so, is that worth holding? And I think for a lot of people, the answer to that is going to be no. I, I just they're going to try it on the days when there are big, um, when there are big players and big opponents from to go up against. But it's not looking to me like it's going to be a, an every night thing. So I, I don't know that he needs to be. Um, uh, a must roster guy. Caruso played 26 off the bench. He had 10, 2, and 3, two steals with two triples. And Kobe White was great, 32, 7, and 4. I'll tell you who wasn't great, though, and that's the big fella, Nikola Vucevic, who had nine points in 39 minutes on 25% shooting with eight rebounds and no defensive stats. And of course, no free throws. Now, the other day, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I said, hey, Vuce struggled a lot earlier this season for a lot of the reasons that I thought he would. And then he started to put together a good, really strong three week stretch. And then we get this nonsense served up. And despite him being really strong over the last couple of weeks, he's still 48th over the last two weeks and 50th for the season. This is a bad game, though. He will be better. And Desumu sort of settled more back into being Desumu. 12-4-2 with four threes is probably more realistic than that 29-point game that he had the last time out. That's totally reasonable. Fine to hold him. If we start seeing him go back to 28 minutes a night, then we can drop. It'll be very interesting to see what happens when Pat Williams returns, which looks like it might be a week or so after the All-Star break. It might not be. It might even be longer. But someone is going to lose out, and it probably does end up being Desumu there. DeRozan had 24-2-6. Pretty good game from him all around. For the Cavs, Evan Mobley still on that restriction. 31 minutes, 14-9 with a steal on a block. Still playing well. And Jarrett Allen, we've seen the significant call-off. 13, 10, and 3 in 35 minutes. He's now 62nd over the last two weeks after that extended stretch of being a top 15 player. And Darius Garland, the buy low is still there. Like 12, 1, and 7 is not ideal. It's not fantastic. There's still a huge room for that to improve. And you might not have to pay very much to get him. I feel pretty confident that both Karis Levert and the Winter Soldier Max Struess are 12 team drops. Get that garbage out of here. 7, 3, and 3 in 30 minutes for Struess and 5, 4, and 9 in 23 for Levert. Niang had 11 points in his 24 minutes, and the Don had 30 and 6, 7 assists on 38%. Donovan Mitchell, 92% from the line. He continues to be unbelievable. Third-ranked player over the last two weeks. He's actually seventh on per-game numbers this season, which I didn't think that he'd be a first-round guy. Sort of had him in that 14 to 17 zone. He's been unbelievable. He's had a really, really impressive and really strong, um, really strong season. The next game was the Indiana Pacers and your Toronto Raptors. The Pacers were without Jalen Smith and Miles Turner. So Isaiah Jackson had to step into the starting lineup. And someone asked me on the pregame show, hey, Josh, what's your stat projection for uh, Isaiah Jackson? I think I missed it by one rebound. I got his like rebounds. I got his blocks, points, assists, bang on, and missed it by like one or two rebounds. I'll never do anything that accurate again. Um. The Pacers win at 127-125. Ben Matherin was also out of this game. Uh, And then Aaron Neesmith left after 17 minutes. So when we talk about a lot of the wings and guards, remember that. Neesmith had eight points in 17 minutes, just hold. So when I talk about Andrew Nempard, who had 14-3-5 with two steals and two threes in 33 minutes, and go, that looks pretty good. Those other players were out. Now, in saying that, Nempard's putting together a solid enough stretch. I think he's an okay 14-team league guy. I'm not massively in on him as a 12, but he's putting together some okay numbers. Halliburton played 34 minutes, so the minutes restriction's done. 21, 4, and 12, two steals, five threes. I hope you got in on the buy low there. While um, Siakam had 23, 5, and 7, and Isaiah Jackson 15 and 11 with four blocks on 54%. Toppin also got extra minutes, so just be careful with... Now, he's still rostered in just far too many 12-team leagues. 
15 and 5, and he had a Richie Benno. Two threes, two steals, and two blocks. But of course, it's because there was no Smith and because there was no Turner. So he played backup four, he played backup five. Uh, Jarris Walker was in the G League. So I don't think that we need to react to that at all with Obi Toppin and think that he's an ad or anything like that. We also got 13 points out of Doug McDermott in 23 minutes because of the absences on the wing. For the Raptors, great response from Barnsley because he was pretty poor in the last game, but he had a huge one here, 29, 12, and 8. Steal, a block, great from the line, great from the field, fantastic game. And we wanted to get some more information about Jakob Pertl and Kelly Linick, and we don't, unfortunately, because Linick lasted seven minutes and was scoreless. I still think that if you've got the ability to hold on to Linick, you do it. I think he's going to be worth holding. I don't think this is a serious problem. But that meant that we got 20 or 30 minutes, actually, out of Jakob Pertl. 9, 10, 11, and two blocks. Now, did he, was the plan for him to get 30 minutes all along? Or did he get 30 minutes because Linick left early? I don't know. And we don't. we won't find out. Emmanuel quickly also had been really struggling, but this was nice to see. 14, 6, and 7 on 46%. Still needs to be rostered. While Bruce Brown, who played 30 last game, dropped under. Gary Trent was low minutes last game. He stepped up, meaning I think I'm just going to go, eh, we don't need to roster him. Brownie had 12, 3, and 3. Trenner had 8, 6, and 3 with two blocks and two threes. Like, that's fine as a streaming thing, but I'm not going to commit to either one of these guys and go, yeah, I'm holding him on my roster. Rowan Barrett had a really interesting Rowan Barrett game. Really good scoring, 23 points, nine rebounds is good. He actually added a triple one, but then he was like four of eight from the line. His free throws have gotten worse in Toronto for whatever reason, and his field goal percentage was strong again, 53%. Despite all of the you know, criticisms that, that I've levied of him or the criticisms that people have levied at me for my criticisms of him, he's 112th over the last two weeks. That's much better than he's been where he's had one top 200 finish in his entire career for fantasy. But it's still not like, wow, this guy's blowing us away because there are a lot of deficits in his game. And the big thing that always stands out is scoring. He has improved efficiency. And it's still a good game, but he still hurts in a few different areas. Um, The Prestige Penis had seven points in 21 minutes. Grade A dick. Not much there. That is just one that we watch. We hope to unveil it at some point in mid-March, late March. Maybe he gets 30 minutes there. It might not happen. We might not get there. But, you know... We edge closer and closer to it with grade A and we just see where it goes because they've committed to giving him minutes and it's just about him like edging in front of Trent and Brown into a larger role. And I do think it'll happen at some point. We just are not quite, quite there yet. Today's episode is brought to you by the big fellas, the legends over at Hungry Root. What is Hungry Root, I hear you ask? Well, Hungry Root is like a box that gets delivered to you. Full of fresh food, fruits, veggies, meats, healthy snack, pantry staples. They ask you quiz questions. They determine your tastes and allergies and likes and dislikes. They see what you use in the kitchen, what appliances you are always got humming in the kitchen. And they decide what box would make sense. You look at it and go, yeah, nah, or you choose what you want or you move stuff out and you can completely revamp it. They send it to you with recommended recipes as well. You save time going to the grocery store. You save money. You reduce food waste. It's a win, win, win all around. Hungry Root is your partner in healthy living. It is the easiest way to get fresh, high-quality groceries and simple, healthy recipes delivered to your door. Right now, Hungry Root is offering Locked On NBA viewers 40% off your first delivery and free veggies for life. Just go to HungryRoot.com slash LockedOn to get 40% off your first delivery and get your free veggies. That is HungryRoot.com slash LockedOn. Don't forget to use our link so that they know that we sent you. All right, let's go on to the next game. And honestly, what the hell do I say about this one? The Brooklyn Nets and the Boston Celtics. Just, yeah, look, just some crazy, like just a, a ridiculous blowout. There were lineup changes here. Dennis Schroeder started in place of Ben Simmons. And Christos Porzingis started for the Celtics with Al Horford out. And then for the uh, Celtics as well, um, of course, they were, they're were they 100% not load managing. They're not doing nothing like the Clippers ever did. Definitely not load managing at all. Jalen Brown just as banged up. Just another unfortunate injury for Jalen. He had to sit this one out. And Sam Hauser started in his place. But yeah, just completely um, coincidental that these guys just keep sitting out games. That's totally, totally not um, planned or, or rest or anything like that. 100% not. They win by 50 points against the Nets, 136-86. If this, this Nets team legitimately turned down multiple first-round picks for Finney Smith or O'Neal or whatever they turned down for Mikael Bridges, they are embarrassing themselves. Like, what, what, is it, what are we doing? Dennis Schroeder started. Played 18 minutes, had 4-3 and three on 25% shoot. Now, you know that I'm not big on Schroeder. I had him on the droppable list on the waiver wire show today. I said, yeah, but hold today because he's probably going to get some okay minutes with Simmons out. But the thing is, 
If you can't do anything good when you push into a larger role as a starter and your team looks like this, then I'm not going to have faith in you as a backup point guard who already struggles on a permanent basis anyway. I don't care to hold him. You can. I don't care to do it. He's a pretty empty scoring guy who has poor efficiency. But it's hard to judge anything because like, I could come in here and tell you, well, look at Cam Thomas. He sucks again. Five points on 11%. And he, it's true. He did suck. But literally everybody else did as well. Cam Johnson had four points on 20%. Dorian Finney-Smith had four points on 25%. Um, Nick Claxton played 21 minutes for six points. Dennis Smith played 18 minutes. Mikael Bridges had 10 on 33%. Everyone was bad. Apart from silly season legend Trendon Watford, who dropped in 15 points in 26 minutes. I don't think there's a takeaway here, really. Like, everyone was bad. Lonnie Walker, Cam Johnson, Finney Smith, Cam Thomas, Jalen Wilson, um, Nick Claxton, Dennis Smith. Everyone was dreadful. The only one I look at there is that I didn't believe that Schroeder was a must-roster player, and I still don't believe that he is. I think you can hold Cam Johnson, but... Yeah, obviously not a good game in his first one back. And on the Celtics, what do I take out of this on this side? Porzingis left early with an ankle sprain. He said he was fine, which he has lied about before. And he said he could have come back in, which maybe he could have. They were 50 points up. But the reason I'll give him the benefit of the doubt here is now they don't play for another eight days. So even if he is lying and he was something a little bit more serious, he's got eight days to rest it up. So I think that he will be okay and will be good to go there. Cornette had 8-8 eight and eight with three blocks with Horford out. We had Drew Holiday not doing much. Who cares? Derek White was great. Peyton Pritchard went crazy. 28 points with six triples in 32 minutes. Sam Hauser hit 14 with four threes. That's all well and good, but it doesn't matter. Not only do we have two starters out, well, not two starters, we had Horford out and Brown out, then Porzingis went out early, and they won by 50. So honestly, like I'm not going to waste your time and tell you there's huge takeaways uh, from this game, because there isn't. Let's go to the next one. The old Memphis Grizzlies. Someone brought this up in the um, pregame show today. They said, hey, the Rockets line looks really weird. Why are they only three-point favorites against the Grizzlies? Well, I don't know. Something was up because they lost. There was a change in the lineup. Luke Kennard, the duck, moved back into the starting lineup. Or Scott Pippen was out. They also had Jacob Gilead out to preserve his G League games. He's got three more days left or three more games left. Because you don't have to play the games. You're only, only, only going to be active for them. Um, Trent Forrest, by the way, in Atlanta has reached his 50-game limit. So they, he's just on the roster, can't play. Not sure what they're doing with that. But Gilead's only got three left. So he didn't play today. And they also kept Trey Jemison out as well. So they went with a, again, very weird, very strange um, lineup setup. But they win, 121-113. Let's talk Houston. Amen Thompson, 34 minutes, 19 and 12, three assists, two steals and a block. Ridiculously good. I still maintain that I don't think he's going to play enough to be a must-roster guy, but what's very interesting here is that Jollibee, Jalen Green, played 23 minutes and he had four points on 29% with three assists. That was... He'd been playing really well, obviously, but even with that little hot stretch, he's now 135th over the last two weeks and has dropped back to being the old Jalen Green, and this was just poor. But is this going to be the regular thing? Would they bench him and play Amen and Fred together? I don't know that they would. And it's another reminder that Amen Thompson is a point guard. He is not a low usage wing like his brother. He is a point guard. I would love to see them do it. I'm just not sure they do. Dylan Brooks was good again. 16 and 10 with two steals. He's definitely streamable. Now, the 25% shooting is rough, but he was good. And uh, Jabari Smith had 6 and 10 on 23%. Terrible from him. And Shingun still struggling. Now, it was just a bad night from the free throws. 29%, 2 of 7. He had 19, 5, and 6 with a triple one, but the buy low is still very much open for the delicate dancer, so see what you can do. He is in a bit of a slump, but that is a terrible performance all around from the Rockets. But we saw it's a game where they played Nate Hinton 15 minutes. We also got 19 points out of Aaron Holiday, um, and there was no Eason, no Van Vliet, no Whitmore, no Bullock as well. Most of these guys, I'm guessing, are going to be available to return. Maybe not Eason after the break. For the Grizzlies, last game, they combined Yuta Watanabe and Lamar Stevens for 53 minutes in the last game. In this game, Lamar Stevens played 20 minutes. All of that, except for 30 seconds, was in the second half. He didn't play at all in the first half. And Yuda was a DNPCD. So this is what I mean about this team being impossible to predict. Now, that's two good games in a row for Lamar Stevens, so I'm definitely keeping an eye on it. He had 14 and 7 with two blocks, but again, literally zero first half minutes. So what, what do we make of this? Where does he fit in? I've seen Lamar Stevens play for Boston and for Cleveland. He's been nothing like this ever. Is this a trustworthy thing? I'm going to say no but I'll keep an eye on it. Vincey Williams had 12 and 8 with 7 assists and 3 steals. Terrible shooting, but everything else was great. And Gigi Jackson was awesome. Now, Gigi had a really strong first half. I think he scored 15 points, but ended up with only 20. He only played 24 minutes. He had 9 
uh, rebounds. He had the three blocks and he was efficient. But again, I still, I, I think he's fine in a points league. In a category league, it's borderline. He's played 27 minutes a night over the last two weeks. He's ranked 232nd. He'll have some okay games. Like, this is a pretty good game. Is he a must roster? I'm not sure that he is. Do you have to drop him? Not really either. You can. It's just one of those ones where it's going to be part and parcel for different people. And I'm not sure ranking wise that he ever looks like a top 100 guy on a consistent basis. This was a good game, but still only got 24 minutes. Jaron had some foul problems. That did lead to more of those Lamar Steven minutes. And I'm sorry, I'm 100% calling it probably for the fourth time this year. We are jacking off Santi Aldama. Get that garbage out of here. 7, 5, and 4. Bad shooting, 22 minutes. Bad. He's bad. Now, there was no Pippen. There was no um, Gilead. So we got 24 minutes of Jordan Goodwin. I won't say that he was awesome, but he also was, if you don't include the free throws. 10, 3, and 3. Triple 1. 50% shooting. He was 1 of 4 from the line. It's really encouraging that game from Jordy Goodwin. Now, with Gilead approaching that maximum and Pippen in and out every game, I don't mind just to look at him if you want to stream him for tomorrow, especially. I don't know what they do with... Look, that's the thing. I don't know what they're going to do every game. Is Gilead and Pippen going to be back next game? Possible. Goodwin should just be starting. To see, but I don't know. Like, Derek Rose probably won't play tomorrow. He played 16 minutes here. We got the return of 22 minutes of, Z- 22 minutes of Zaire Williams. John Concha played only 20. It's a complete dart throw every single game. So while, yes, I, I would love it if Goodwin played every game and played 30 minutes because we'd definitely add him. It's just not going to happen. 10-3-3 three, and three in 24 minutes for Geordie. It's worth watching. And then Kennard played 30. But is, will he play tomorrow? He'd been playing 24 a night. He had 19-2-2, two and two, Luke, with four threes on 71%. But he takes no shots. The man's one of the best shooters in the NBA, and he never shoots it. 71% on seven attempts. The frustrations are pretty real with trying to figure out that team. And it's going to lead to a lot of um, wasted moves and poor decisions in fantasy. And it's hard to, it's hard to avoid because the appeal is there. All right, let's... Let's take it on to the next one. It is the Wizards and the New Orleans Pelicans, a lineup change um, in this one as well because we had Kyle Kuzma, the future MVP, was sick and Bilal Kulabali moved into the starting lineup to take his place and we had some very, very interesting things happen uh, in this game. If I try to make sure I hit the right button there. So... On the Washington side of things, another strong performance from Marvin Bagley. Bagley had 14 and 10 with two blocks in his uh, 30 minutes. Yes, he didn't shoot particularly well, but he just should be on a roster. I cannot believe that it took 16 weeks and I was like, all right, fine, move on from Jordan Poole. And then he goes out and he does this and he has, what do you have, 16 points, five rebounds, seven assists, three steals, four of eight from three, and you go... Like, seriously, do I have to go and re-add you now? Like, I'm not super confident in it. There was no Kuzma here, but man, like, that is just incredibly frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating. Tyus Jones was solid again, 14 with 13 assists and a steal, and Bilal had 6, 3, and 1. I think Bilal needs probably a couple of guys to be out for him to be a 12-team league player, but I've buried the lead a bit here. I put this guy as a sell, sell high yesterday. Denny Avdia, 43 points. 14 rebounds and a block. The sell high is here. It is massive. I'll tell you why. Again, 60% from three, 11 of 13 from the line. This is a guy who has never been a good free throw shooter. He has never been a good three-point shooter. He has never been this level of two-point shooter, and he is doing it all together. Now, he is playing at a ridiculously high rate, but it's not about, well, maybe he's improved because nobody is this good at these numbers. So there is a huge sell high, if possible. Now, for some of you, you'd be like, Josh, there's absolutely no way I can sell high a waiver wire guy. And that is totally cool. Maybe that is true. But at some point, a waiver wire guy turns into a guy that's just on rosters. And then you start deciding that. If you've got some sort of rule in your league where you don't trade waiver wire guys, and I don't know what's going on because value changes a ton. And at some point, we do have to adjust that. Huge sell high moment for him. Not much else going on here. Corey Kispert, actually, that's not true. Corey Kispert had 32 points with five triples in 20 minutes, six assists. Good to see that. All of this, though, is interesting because Kuzma was out. If Kuzma plays, Kispert doesn't do this. Avdi probably doesn't do exactly this. Jordan Poole probably doesn't do this. But it is a good indicator in case um, Kuz misses further time down the stretch. Interesting that we're getting only three minutes of DeLon right now. Uh, he just doesn't play. I'm like, okay, cool. But the Pelicans, 15 minutes for Jonas Valanciunas. Uh, it's worrying. 10 points, five rebounds, three assists. We're not quite at a situation where Valanciunas is a drop. But he's outside the top 120 over the last two weeks. 
He's now fallen to outside the top 70 for the season. We are hurtling. In the games that Zion sits, he's great. The games that Zion plays, he's not. And if you're in like an eight-team league, you'd be all right to move on. If you're in a 10, it's getting very borderline. Now, it doesn't mean that we're adding Larry Nance because we're not, unless we're in a deeper format. Nance had four, five, and three with three steals. The three steals are nice. And then we thought, are we going to get something good consistently out of Herb Jones? And I guess the answer is no. Four and six with one assist in only 26 minutes, while it was Alvarado who played 22, Najee Marshall who played 24, and Trey Murphy who played 30. And you go, well, that's great. I should be adding Trey Murphy then if he played 30. Well, not really. He had nine points with four rebounds and three steals, which is like, all right. Their bench, though, what a crazy line from their bench. Nance, three steals. Marshall, three steals. Alvarado, two steals. And Murphy, three steals. So, yeah. Are we back to that situation where Jones and Murphy and Nance and maybe even Valanchunas are just like back-end streamy guys? Maybe. I wouldn't rush to add Murphy. I wouldn't rush to add Jones if he was on the wire. But if I had him, I'd probably hold on. Zion was great. 32, 6, and 8. Ingram was solid. 18, 3, and 7. And McCullum, good bounce back. So he had some uh, poor games the last couple. Um, 24, 3, and 6 with a steal. His block numbers have completely dried up, though, after he had that really hot stretch to begin the year because of the way they changed the uh, recording or scoring of blocks in the stats. On to the next game. Which one is it? It is the Dallas Mavericks hosting the San Antonio Spurs. Lineup changes in this one. I think we were okay. I don't think we needed any lineup changes in this one. No, we are, we are good to go. So, big blowout. 93 points only for the Spurs. That's a bit disappointing. Wembenyama started off the game ridiculous, and he ended it ridiculous, but he's still only playing 27 minutes. 26, 9, and 5. One steal, three blocks, two dribbles. Again, uh, what do you want me to tell you? Like, he's ridiculous. Malachi Branham stepping up at the moment. 21 minutes, 19 points. Now, I'm not into adding him, but he's stepping ahead of, like, Bubble Champagne. He's stepping ahead of... Um, Players like Blake Wesley, who also played okay here. Just one to watch for deeper leagues. 28 minutes for Blake Wesley, 9, 2, and 5, because they benched t- uh, Trey Jones really early. He played only 20 minutes and had 4, 4, and 2, Trey. I don't think that's anything long-term, but it's it's something to note. And then the horse, Keldon Johnson, backed up his big game with one of the worst games you will ever see. 3 and 2 on 9% shooting with one block. He now is 144th over the last two weeks in 26 minutes a night, and you do not need to roster him in 12-team leagues. Vassell had 11, 4, and 6 with three steals. Definitely not his best, and it was an okay Sohan game, 10 and 4. It was also a pretty good Zach Collins game. 6 and 12 with five assists, but I do not care. He is still incredibly over-rostered in 12-team leagues. He shouldn't be on them. And Jeremy Jeremy Sohan, while he was at one point looking like he might be a nice guy to just hold on through all of this, I don't think that he is. I think he's probably also a little bit over-rostered. You can hold him. You don't have to. Not a bad game from Sohan with 10, 4, and 3 steals in those 25 minutes, but not something I'm super enthused about. Well, we got Daniel Gafford starting and Derek Lively available. There was no Muxy Kleber in this one, but I still don't fully know. What I wanted to see was if they started Lively immediately here, that was a great sign for Lively because he was coming in on a minutes restriction, but they brought him off the bench. So is he coming off the bench because it's a restriction? Will they switch things up over the break? I don't know, but Lively played 17 minutes. He had eight and five with three blocks. We hold. Gafford played 23 minutes. He had 10 and 10 with a block. We hold. But again, people were ready to completely glaze Daniel Gafford yesterday. Not even talking about fantasy people. Some of them, yes. But a lot of just real NBA players. What a uh, Real NBA people, real NBA advisors, analysts, whatever you want to call them, right? Oh, Gafford, unbelievable. He's awesome. And Gafford is okay, but we, we push it way too far. Yes, I think he's a better player at the moment than Lively. He's definitely not a better player in the future or any bigger part of their future. And he's a better fantasy producer at the moment, Gafford. But we still need to see how this plays out. 23 for Lively, 17... Sorry, 23 for Gafford, 17 for Lively while there is a restriction. Josh Green, 8 points in 18 minutes. We do not roster Josh Green. And PJ Washington had 3 and 6 on 17%. Yeah, we can move on. Get that garbage out of here! He's crazily inconsistent, and now he's on a team where not as much usage. I thought there'd be a little bit more safety in his minutes, but apparently not. Irving had 34, 9, and 7, and Doncic had 27, 9, and 8 with two steals and two blocks. Both of those guys were ridiculously good in this one, and what ended up being a pretty comfortable victory in the end for Dallas over San Antonio. All right, let's do the next game. The Kings and the Nuggets. The Nuggets... 
Oh, they're so sneaky, those Denver Nuggets. Malone told us that Jamal Murray and KCP were doubtful, but the team said, no, 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 you're actually questionable. So, of course, they were out. They were always going to be out. Well, KCP was always going to be out. Reggie Jackson started. Justin Holiday started. I think that's a gigantic indictment on Christian Brown. I know Justin Holiday hasn't even been in the rotation, but last season, like that guy that was playing that role, Bruce Brown, would just start. But the fact that they go to these washed-up veterans, and Jackson's been better, Holiday has not. So they go to those guys over Christian Brown. I would just suggest that maybe he hasn't taken the steps forward that they would have hoped for this season. 102-90-98, the final score here. Um, some huge games, obviously. From the big fella in Sacramento, Demontis Sabonis, who has been obviously awesome um, for a big stretch of time. He did start a little bit slow this year, but he's putting up some big numbers now. He drops in the old, um, what do you have, 20 points, 13 rebounds, 7 assists, and 3 steals. He had 3 blocks in the last game. as 3 steals here. That's huge. Uh, Darren Foxy Fox, great. We finally get a good game going. 30 points, 8 assists, 8 rebounds, 2 steals, still 4 of 6 from the line, which is frustrating. Well, the pencil Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. Twenty points for Barnsley with three threes. He took nine shots only. We don't trust it. We don't use him. Leaky Monk played the 30 minutes. Unfortunately, he shot just 18%, six, three, and three. We still roster him. While Fanta Pants had eight, five, and two and chipped in with two blocks, he is just a fringe guy. And the Keegan Murray slide continues. Post-game, uh, Mike Brown was like, yeah, like I'm a bit worried. He's a bit banged up. He's had some foot issues. Uh, okay, cool. He must because he's bad at the moment. Six and five in 35 minutes. 25% shooting outside the top 200 over his last eight games and is barely clinging to life inside the top 100 for the season, outside the top 100 for points leagues. He's not a drop, but yeah, like, again, I don't really know where where we go with him from a fantasy perspective. He needs to be able to do more on a more consistent basis. Trey Lyles returned, but only played the 12 minutes. Um, he's uh, returned from illness, which uh, cost him the game yesterday. Not a lot else. On that side of things, for the Nuggets, they were without those two starters. Let's start with the replacements. Reggie Jackson, 10, 5, and 9. That's great. I don't think we're going to get anything out of him after the break because this is not a long-term thing for Jamal, so don't worry about that. While Justin Holiday had eight points with four rebounds and two threes. Well, that's basically Contavious Caldwell Pope, isn't it? We don't care about that. Michael Ponder had 15 and 4. Jokic, really weirdly bad game from Jokic. Like, you don't normally get this from uh, from Big Chungus. He had 15, 5, and 8, but shot 6 of 17. Yuck. 35% from the field. That's terrible from Jokic. Uh, but it was a big Aaron Gordon game, 25 and 15. But this it, is what happens. At this point of the year, you get random uh, tiredness, random fatigue, weird, wacky games. This stuff happens quite often at this um, point in the season. Not a lot else to talk about there from the Nuggets. We did get Colin Gillespie as a part of the rotation, but obviously he didn't do much. We've got Peyton Watson with a steal and a block. With that. That's cool. There's just not a lot. I don't think, to um, to take out of this game in general. The next one, we had the Detroit Pistons. Old legend Monty Williams coaching against his former team. There was a change in the lineup for the Suns because Brad Beal was out due to a hamstring issue. So Eric Gordon moved into that starting lineup. Um, and yeah, we had, no surprise, the Pistons get smacked by the Suns 116-100 is the final score here in this one. Now, if you are, like some uh, some sites have some weird, there's some weird data issues with the NBA today. So you'll find sometimes on the NBA app that there are scores that are off on Basketball Monster. Some of our box scores are off on ESPN. Some have been off. There's just been a lot of stuff that's been off in general. Simone Fontecchio started again for the Pistons. He had 18 points. That's cool, but he played 21 minutes. He was a minus 13 and he had one rebound. The 15 shots is really interesting, but I still don't know that he's a must-roster player. To me, he looks very, very fringy. Uh, Asar Thompson, 29 minutes, 14 and 7 with two steals and a block. Yep, we're, we're rostering him. There's going to be issues for sure. The absence of Isaiah Stewart currently with injury, maybe later with jail time. I'm joking. But uh, obviously, there's something going on, going on there. He's not ideal. And then, what's the rest of this rotation? What is Tavares doing? 15 minutes for Jaden Ivey. Yes, he missed all six of his shots. He had two points. Dreadful game. 2-0 and 0 is really bad. But do I need 26 minutes of the disease scrotum again? Do I need 24 Mark Assassin minutes? Do I need 23 Shake Milton minutes? The answer is obviously no. Just foolish, foolish stuff. Cade Cunningham had 13, 4 and 8. He had five turnovers. Wasn't his best game. He was far from their worst player, but he only got 26. While Jalen Duran had 7, 9 and 5 with two steals. Again, he got montied. What, I don't know what we do with this. 
Wiseman had, uh, so he found out in 12 minutes, he's putrid, should not see the court ever. Fournier had the 10 points. Milton had 13, 9, and 2. Sasser had four points. What I do know is that we're not rostering Sasser in 12s. Thompson, we are. Duran, we are. Cunningham, we are. Ivor, we are. And then there's just a lot of nonsense that's going to happen. They could be. Could they be moving into Grizzlies territory of I don't know what to do with this roster? The thing is with the Pistons, it's very obvious what they need to do. They just have one of the worst coaches, if not the literal worst coach in the NBA, who is, I don't know. what, what is I, I don't know. What is going on? And I talked about this in some of my other shows, my little betting idea that I had that was very successful. I just didn't have the time to do it. And we had the perfect example of why it would work because Devin Booker had, got ejected after five minutes. He had seven, one, and one in that time and was ejected. Grayson Allen, not at his best, but nine, one, and six is okay. We're still rostering him. Nurk had 10, 13, and seven, and Eric Gordon had 13, one, and two with two steals and two blocks. In fact, he had two threes as well. That's a Richie Benno for Eric Gordon. I don't know where the Beal is going to be out after the break. So if you wanted to drop Gordon, that's okay. And then we could stream him in later on. Durant had 25, 6, and 6 with two blocks. Good numbers there. We also had David Roddy have his first action for Phoenix. We don't care. While Royce O'Neal had 9, 7, and 3 with two steals. Royce is a really solid 14-team league player, but that's really about it. And as you can see, the bench was fully extended here because they won very easily because they were against Monty Williams. And if there's any team that knows that he's a bad coach, it might be the one that fired him. Akogi had two points in his 18 minutes, and I don't even know why I mentioned that, to be honest. The next game, we take a look at the Lakers went into Utah to take on the Utah Jazz. LeBron told us yesterday that he was going to be sitting out this one due to it being the back-to-back. So he did sit it out due to it being the back-to-back. Um, so we got Torian Prince moving back into the starting lineup uh, to replace LeBron back into that starting spot that Pockets has had saved up and kept warm for him for you know those last couple of games that has been insufferable for him to stay out of there. We got a comfortable victory for the Lakers in the end. 138-122, the final score. Austin Reeves is starting to play really well. He's top 25 over the last two weeks. 22-3-8 with three steals. That brings him to 69th on the season. And I thought, I had him around the 80 mark, I think, in the draft season. And in the end, maybe even yeah, about 85. And it looked really bad for a period of time. Well, he's 69th now. And it's paying off really, really well at the moment, which is great. Rui Hachimura, my man, went off. I want to dig back to something a little bit later about Denny Avdi, but this is almost one of those great situations where we can really, really pay attention to see who's paying attention to fantasy as well. 34 minutes and 36 points is a great output from Rui. He had six threes, and it looks great. 36, two, and one. Right? That is the problem with Rui, is that he does nothing apart from score, and he's very inconsistent with scoring and minutes and shot attempts and shot profile. This was great. 68% is fantastic. Six of eight from three is unbelievable. But it's not real. It's fake. It doesn't continue. There's no way that it continues. It just does not happen. And if you go to add Rui Hachimura after this game, you do not get this game added onto your team. It doesn't work that way. And when you offer nothing else, which Rui does not offer anything else, it's going to be wasted, I believe. He obviously got extra shots because A, they were going in, and B, LeBron was out. D'Angelo Russell weird to see so little usage in a game without LeBron, but 11, 9, and 16 assists is great. And Davis had 37 and 15 with gigantic volume. And unfortunately, not great from the line, but he did take 13 shots there. And we got another chance to look at Spencer Dinwiddie, and he had 10, 0, and 4. I don't think that Spencer Dinwiddie is a 12-team league player. This was a game without LeBron, and he still was like mid. Torian Prince was mid, 11 points in 33 minutes with a 3. And the Crucifix had a bit of an ankle problem, Christian Wood, but he did play through it. He had 2 and 4 in those minutes. So, like, we got a really good game from Hachimura, but that brings me on to that point that I should have referenced earlier about Denny Avdia, because I didn't... Re- I actually, I didn't reference it earlier because I didn't see it till later. That brings me to another thing I've got to talk about. But when you see these games, right, and Avdia had a great game, and then you see mainstream media, which makes me sound really lame. Don't follow the mainstream media. Be careful of the mainstream. They're all like... Yeah. When you see mainstream NBA accounts, whether that is people who work for ESPN, CBS... NBC, uh, work for independent sites, work for whoever it is when they're talking about the NBA. Well, I'm talking about those sort of accounts who focus on the NBA, right? They don't talk fantasy at all. When you see those accounts, when you see um, NBA University, uh, chucks out a lot of stat accounts. When you check out any like stat news or any of the, just quietly, those uh, accounts that are like individual player news. Oh, here I am, Colin Castleton news, like, bro. 
you couldn't ride the meat any harder, could you? Like, we don't need those accounts. But when you see Stat Muse or those sort of accounts start to chuck out stats. This is a long runway. I'm not there necessarily, but we are going to get there eventually and send the delivery down. When you see those things start to pump it out, and this is brought to my attention because I saw Sam Quinn from CBS, someone tagged me, t- tweeted about Denny Avdia's recent performances, and other people start to get in and how good Denny Avdia's been. I saw a Grizzlies guy get, hey, if we don't get a top four pick, we trade that pick for Denny Avdia. What we do as a fantasy community is they see, man, Avdia's killing it. Look at these numbers. And we look at it and go, yeah, he's shooting 70% from the field. There's zero chance that this stuff holds. But when the mainstream opinions, stat muses, NBA universities, whoever it is, is putting the numbers out and you look at it and go, wow, he's, uh, hey, Denny, may, yeah, maybe, maybe. And then you see people go, yeah, I knew he was good. I had him number one in my draft class. Yeah, he's going to be awesome. We should go and attack him, get him out from the Wizards. He's going to be great. When that stuff starts to pervade, that is where the sell high becomes so much easier because everyone's going, yeah, Denny's great. Look, at everyone's talking about how awesome he is. But we should sit here and go, yeah, but the man's shooting 50% from three. He's going 70% from two. And there's just no way that any of this stuff is real. It just cannot hold. It doesn't matter who you are. You're, Michael Jordan can't hold those numbers. LeBron can't hold those numbers. So Denny Avdia can't hold those numbers. So when all of those big accounts start talking about this player having a mini breakout through a four-game hot streak, we, they talk about how good it is and how awesome it is. But we should look at it and go, yeah, but. It's the yeah, but. And that's where Avdia is. And I reckon that Rui game, if we got two or three of those in a row from Rui, we'd get that as well. That is how you turn that into a sell high. Because someone will go, well, the, everyone's talking about Denny. Look, he must be awesome, yeah? And then you turn out there's something good. Now, in your league, because I know your league's the most competitive league ever, and no one would ever fall for it, but it will happen in some leagues. And it's always worth being receptive to the offer or considering the offer or whatever. Because when that seeps into mainstream coverage, that is when you can start to feel people get, get swept up in the hype. That happens. For the Jazz. The big fella, Keontae George, the speaker, 13, 5, and 7, two steals, three threes, 56% bang, 12 team player. That is a 12 team line. Now, I don't know that he, having consistency to do it is what makes you a must roster guy. I think grabbing him is, is worthwhile, but uh, I feel confident that his role is pretty good. Chris Dunn only played 17 minutes, but he had 12, 1, and 3. That's streamable. We're not going to rely upon that. Sexton had 18 points, strong. Kessler had 12 and 7 with three blocks, strong. Markinen, not at his best. And Johnny Collins had a double double. But there was some nice numbers right across the board. The fact that they got beaten so easily because defense was pretty poor, but most of their contributors played well. Horton Tucker had 7, 2, and 4. Cool for him. Well, uh, good, good stuff from Taylor Hendricks in terms of just getting a few shots to fall. Nine shots in 16 minutes is interesting. Nine and five with a three is interesting. We're keeping him on the watch list, Taylor Hendricks, for later in the year. But I think that that sort of performance makes us want to get ahead of it with Keontae George, even though we've talked about getting ahead of him the last couple of days. We get ahead of it again, understanding that you've got to brace for some impact of some bad games, but a relatively positive overall performance there from Keontae George. Um. Before I go into talking about the last game, just a quick reminder now, I've had some stuff that happens. Sometimes stuff happens outside of what me recording this show. And I'm not going to do the full recap of the show. I'm not going to be able to have time to do the full line of the night, all that sort of stuff. Something happened with my son on public transport and he got bloody sent on the wrong bus and I had to go rush to go take him to work. I've got to go pick him up from work. So I'm not going to have full, again, if you, I could do it, but then your show comes out three hours later. So I'm just giving you that heads up now that after we recap the final game, um, I won't be doing the full uh, you know, TV presentation of Lines of the Night on on uh, for this 13-game day. So just giving you that heads up now. All right, let's go to the final game of the night. Clippers and Warriors was that final game. We know that Kawhi was out, so the Clippers started Amir Coffey in place of him. But I would expect that Kawhi is okay and ready to go um, after the All-Star break. And if he does play in the All-Star game, I would imagine pretty low minutes. The Clippers win it 130 to 125. It's another one of these weird games where there's box score issues all over the place. Paul George fouled out in 33 minutes, but he had 24, 5, and 5 with two steals before that. And we finally got big minutes from Zubats. I was like, hey, if his limits are going to stay low for a while, we need to consider what we're doing. Well, he played 28. He had 13 and 10 with two steals and two blocks. Great. Jimmy Harden played 40. He had 26, 8, and 7. And we got pretty good game from Amir Coffey, who's been sort of like a 14-team league option. 14 and 6 in his 24, and man had 9, 5, and 4. We also got, as expected, with Kawhi out, more stuff from Russell Westbrook. 
15, 5, and 6 with a steal in 31 minutes. And it was also a good Norman Powell game. 21, 2, and 0. Good scoring. But of course, all of those guys get bumped usage, bumped minutes with Kawhi out. And I don't think that matters too much. We also had a weird, like, big, like, sort of punch-on situation. Ty Lue's the only one who got ejected, even though it did seem that Clippers guys were leaving the bench. We'll see if there's any suspensions that come down. If the NBA does find that they did leave the bench, it is an automatic one-game suspension. I haven't actually seen exactly who that was that left the bench. But again, just be aware of that, and we'll get more information of that over the next 24 to 48 hours. For the Warriors, Kaminga, we have started to see a bit of a slowdown here again. It continues to happen. He had 13, 8, and 6. The 6 assists are great, but no defensive stats, um, and just lower volume of everything. Andy Wiggins, 10 points on 40%. Yuck. He did have um, four steals, which is great. I think he's more fringy than anything. And Clay, another disappointing game. He has the big one, which was last time, and then goes back to this. 12 points, 4 of 14 shooting, 1 of 9 from 3, 3 rebounds and an assist. I don't think that you need to hold on to Clay Thompson. I realize I haven't done this for a while, and it feels like maybe I'm picking on Clay, but I just remember to do it, so... He is... I, I really wonder what happens to Clay Thompson in free agency next year. What? How much does he get? He's not playing very well. Draymond had 9, 10, and 4, and Steph had 41 with 5 assists. Steph is on a massive hot streak at the moment as well. Four consecutive games of 7 threes in a row. Great game from Pajemski. 32 minutes for him, 25, 7, and 8 with a steal. Last game was a little bit disappointing from Pajemski. He's sort of on the fringes to me. I do think I, I like him in a points league, but there's going to be the issue with Chris Paul returning and how they distribute these minutes. Like He should play more minutes than Clay on most nights and probably than Wiggins, but it doesn't always happen that way. Well, Gaz Payton got 2-2-3. Two, two, and three. He'd been playing all right, Gazza, but didn't end up uh, getting us there in the end. Like I said, I'm not going to be able to do the full um, end up of the show, and we're also having all these weird data box score import issues over at Basketball Monster as well. Oh, that actually has just updated, so I can actually just go through quickly and give you the lines of the night without providing you the graphics. Kyrie is the monstrous line of the night. The waiver wire line of the night, let me just have a quick scan down. Oh, it's Trey Mann very easily there. The young gun of the night is Paolo Bunkero, who actually finished second in the monstrous line of the night. And we go down to look at the dud of the night. Well, it's obviously the horse, Keldon Johnson, who had three points on 9% shooting. That will bring us to the end of the show. Again, hope you guys enjoyed all 13 games. Sorry for the brief cutoff here at the end. Go over and hit the notification bell if you are on YouTube. Subscribe, thumbs up, comments. And on the audio side, you can be a double banger. Watch the video, listen to the audio, subscribe, tell your friends, share it, all of that stuff. Guys, we are done here. I don't know why I feel like I'm missing something, but I am. Hey, live mailbag, 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow with Kingy. Get onto it. We are done here. Thank you so much for watching and for listening, everyone. See ya.